It's eight o'clock. This is the UK Tonight. I'm Greg Milam. The final journey home, grieving families of the aid workers killed in Gaza say lessons must now be learnt. As relatives pay tribute to their selfless work in Gaza, we'll assess the repercussions of the attack on the aid convoy. Coming up, as international condemnation of the attack grows and some charities pause their work in Gaza, we'll speak to Oxfam about the questions over the future of aid there. Also tonight, more pressure on Paula Venels as secret recordings appear to show when the former boss of the post office knew that sub-postmaster accounts could be accessed remotely. In the wartime bunker, Sky News reveals Britain's lack of planning for a major conflict. And have you been dazzled by headlight glare? We'll discuss concerns they've become too bright and are causing accidents. All that to come and much more on The UK Tonight. Good evening. The families of the three British men killed in Gaza, John Chapman, James Kirby and James Henderson, have shared their grief and praised their work in what's been described as the world's most dangerous place to deliver aid. But what now for the humanitarian effort in Gaza? If international aid agencies are not able to carry out their work, despite coordinating their movements with the Israeli military, what options do they have left? The wider aid community has been left reeling by the fatal attack on the world's central kitchen, and the families are calling for answers and for lessons to be learned from this tragedy. Our home editor, Jason Farrell, has more. They each fought for their country, but died in a war that was not theirs. The three British military veterans who'd been providing security for aid workers are now en route to the UK. Their families say they return as heroes. James Kirby, a former army sniper, remembered today by his cousins. It's just devastating, devastating that he's fought in these wars and come home with not a scratch, and he goes out to do something, you know, helpful. Yeah. And that's what happened. He knew he had to go. His friends were telling him that this was, this was probably a bad place to go, but he knew he had to go and help people, and that was James all over. He just didn't think of himself, and I think he, on his past experiences of going to Afghanistan and Bosnia, he knew the dangers. He, he, was, he was no fool in that regard, um, but he just knew he had to help people. James was among seven aid workers killed in an Israeli airstrike while delivering food to besieged Palestinians. Alongside him was James Henderson, who'd served for six years in the Royal Marines and was remembered today in his hometown of Falmouth. If you were one of his people, he would die for you. And he's such a beautiful, beautiful part of all of our lives. And John Chapman, a former Special Forces commando who joined the military from school. In a statement, his family said, we're devastated to have lost John, who was killed in Gaza. He died trying to help people and was subject to an inhumane act. He was an incredible father, husband, son and brother. He was loved by many and will forever be a hero. He will be missed dearly. I just hope this is a turning point in, in the world now and, and what's happening in Gaza. I don't want to make a political thing of it, but we just hope that world leaders can get together and, and help these people. Israel says the strike was unintended, but the British government wants to know more. I spoke to Prime Minister Netanyahu last night and was very clear with him that the situation is increasingly intolerable and what we urgently need to see is a thorough, transparent investigation into what has happened. Labour also wants an investigation. The Lib Dems go further. I really think is now is the time to end uh, British exports of arms to Israel. It does look like Israel has broken humanitarian law. One thing that will be impacted is aid. Multiple charities are to suspend food deliveries to the Palestinians. But the security firm where the soldiers worked says it hopes to continue its work. Everything that we did was as much as we could do. Um, our staff continue to be professional and focused on the task in hand, and we will continue business as usual. This was an international relief team. Zomi Franken, an Australian. Jacob Flickinger, an American-Canadian. 
It all adds to the global pressure on Israel to explain why more than 200 aid workers have been killed in this conflict. Jason Farrell, Sky News. Well, earlier we heard from the former chief executive of World Central Kitchen, Nate Mook, who knew two of those killed, Zomi Frankham and Damien Sobol, personally. He was speaking to my colleague, Mark Austin. I think it was absolutely shocking uh, when the news came over. Um, it was just hard to believe. I think most of us still can't wrap our heads around it. It just seems so surreal. I've talked to many of Zami's friends and, and former colleagues, and, and we just, you know, we sort of are living in this collective disbelief right now. Um, of course, the situation in Gaza is uh, extraordinarily dangerous, but the World Central Kitchen team, as they've communicated, uh, we're working very closely uh, with the Israelis and, and to let them know exactly all of the movements. I spoke to uh, one of the other uh, WCK team members in Gaza, Damien, who is from Poland, and, and I met him through our Ukraine response. He came and showed up at our kitchen just across the border in Poland and served uh, probably millions of meals to Ukrainian refugees. And so many volunteers who came through were touched by Damien. I, just the outpouring of support, he was such a sweet, sweet individual. And I had spoken to him a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, he, he said, you know, they were coordinating with the Israelis, so they were keeping as safe as possible. And so, you know, for something like this to happen, it's just... It just makes no sense. So, so you've got experience of this, clearly, uh, I mean, in several, um, you know, conflict zones. The cars were clearly marked. Uh, there had been this contact with the Israelis who should have known where they were, when they were there and so forth. How do you think it could have happened? I mean, what, what do you think went wrong? You know, I, I know there's a lot of investigations going on, and I'm sure the World Central Kitchen team is is looking into all of the details and, and seeing what happened. You know, I, I will say that I, I've never been to Gaza myself. Um, we we did work uh, in 2021 in Gaza through a partner, Anera, after a previous conflict, but after the conflict had ended. And so I would I would hesitate to speculate what the situation is like. Of course, it, yes, Ukraine is also a war zone, but it's also a, a completely different situation. And so, you know, I think for me, it's it's of course we want to know, we want accountability, we want the families to be recognized. But right now, you know, I know we're, we're trying to remember, um, you know, we're sharing photos and videos of Zami and Damien and Saif, the, 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 the Palestinian who was working with the team. And of course, um, the, the three British team members and, and Jacob from Canada, you know, these are, these are people, these aren't just numbers and statistics and, and, and aid workers added to a role. You know, and so right now, really the focus is on talking about them and, and that's, with with my friends and former colleagues, you know, we, we want to celebrate the the amazing, uh, you know, these individuals that really were were there in service to to the world. Nate Mook there. Well, I'm joined now by, by Michelle Farrington, a public health spokesperson for Oxfam. Michelle, thanks very much for for talking to us on the UK uh, tonight. As we heard there, the the the, the impact on the ground. Uh, in Gaza is is significant with, with the events of the last 24 hours. What what is how has that left the situation on the ground in Gaza for for aid teams there? Thanks. And and first of all, I'd just like to pass on my condolences to all of those who who might have lost uh, a loved one in in the attack yesterday. Um, but really, the reality is that many aid agencies, Oxfam, our partners, and other aid agencies, we've been operating under conditions like this since the 6th of October. You know, there hasn't really been kind of much certainty in terms of deconfliction, in terms of ensuring that humanitarian aid operations are being run safely, um, that the coordination and, and kind of making sure that um, humanitarian aid operations are kind of being um, seen as, as neutral and not being targeted, that, that hasn't really happened kind of throughout the whole time that the conflict has been going on. So as tragic as yesterday was, it isn't really too much of a change in the context other than it really highlights how dangerous it is to provide aid in Gaza at the moment. When you see the World Central Kitchen pausing operations, other organisations, the UN saying they'll suspend nighttime movements for the next 48 hours, what does that mean practically for, for what work is able to, to carry on on the ground beyond those, those Palestinian members of, of, of teams who are there? 
Yeah, I mean, essentially, the aid that is happening at the moment is is really just a drop in the ocean compared to what is needed. And any changes in terms of the momentum of trying to push further assistance into Gaza, um, any changes in that is, of course, going to have an, an additional disastrous effect on on the needs that people already have. We've heard from the Israeli government. They, they've accepted this was a, a misidentification, a mistake. Uh, these things happen in war, said, said the Prime Minister. What do you say to those, those, those defences coming from the Israeli government? I think it's a, it's, it's a little hard sometimes to accept that it was an unavoidable incident, um, particularly because there is quite a lot of coordination that happens between humanitarian agencies and the Israeli authorities to make sure that we can provide aid assistance safely, both for humanitarian staff and the people who are receiving humanitarian aid. Um, but the fact that we're seeing over 200 aid workers killed so far, along with 32,000 innocent Gazans also being killed as well, I mean, it, it's very difficult to kind of accept that, well, this was just a mistake. Um, it, it makes the situation of being able to provide additional assistance in Gaza just extremely more complicated, um, extremely more difficult. And at the end of the day, that, that leaves people in Gaza who are already suffering so much, who are facing famine-like conditions, who have no healthcare systems available, their housing is destroyed. It means that the assistance that they need is not getting to them. You mentioned deconfliction, and the US State Department has said tonight the US wants to see better deconfliction uh, measures in place. What does that mean? What does it look like uh, for, for those who need to be working on the ground? I think it looks like really respecting the neutrality that humanitarian aid should have. Um, it really looks at, you know, um, I think many humanitarian agencies, um, Oxfam and our partners included, are being very clear and, and very um, upfront in terms of giving locations, giving advance warning of any operations that they want to do, like distributions or aid or movements, assessment visits, for example. Um, I think those are being provided well enough in advance that there shouldn't be any issues in terms of um, targeting the wrong location or targeting kind of the, the wrong vehicles, for example. Um, the technology that is available um, in, in modern warfare means that you know, targeting is extreme, can be extremely accurate. So there is no need really for, for kind of um, mistakes to be made in terms of targeting, particularly where um, agencies are being very open and sharing those coordinates, sharing those plans ahead of time and making sure that they get the relevant authorizations to ensure that they can work safely. And just very briefly, when do you think those organizations that have paused their work will be able to, to resume it? Um, I hope that they'll be able to resume soon, but I, I would say that what we really need to be able to um, provide humanitarian assistance in Gaza is an immediate ceasefire. Without that and without full access to the Gaza Strip, we are not going to be able to provide the support that, that um, thousands and millions of people in Gaza need. Michelle Farrington from Oxfam, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Well, the ongoing fallout from the attack is sure to feature in uh, tomorrow's newspapers. We'll have our extended press preview uh, from 10.30 this evening with tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Joining us will be The Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin Maguire, and The Telegraph's deputy comment editor, Annabelle Denham. Now, secret recordings obtained by Sky News have renewed pressure on the former boss of the post office, Paula Venels, ahead of her appearance at the public inquiry into the Horizon scandal. New evidence appears to show that she'd been briefed back in 2013 that the tech firm Fujitsu did have access to change sub-postmaster accounts remotely. It wasn't until 2019 that the post office admitted there had been problems, by which time hundreds of people had been falsely accused and some wrongly sent to prison. Here's our business correspondent, Adele Robinson. To set the scene, it's 2013 and sub-postmasters' lives are being ruined by the post office through wrongful prosecutions. This secret tape recording obtained by Sky News is of a meeting between forensic accountants Ian Henderson and Ron Warmington and the post office company secretary and chief lawyer. Another risk in the whole process is Fujitsu getting nervous about the whole thing and I, and I am picking up some vibes along those lines. 
I think you should mention that actually, Ron, in your email. Okay. Um, because we have got a difficult few years with them, I think. They're talking about evidence showing Fujitsu were able to remotely access Branch Horizon accounts, proving post office officials knew years before publicly admitting it. What we're seeing from the, from the emails is they were getting instructions, in effect, directly from the help desk saying, look, we need this fixed. You know, can you work your magic? And, you know, the responses are going back, yeah, it will be done in the, in the overnight run tonight. We will, we will change the balances or, you know, whatever. And crucially, this proof Chief Executive of Post Office Paula Venels was briefed. She's got everything. The, the way that I've tried to brief Paula is as soon as I have evidence that, you know, that there is a problem, I, she knows about it the next minute. And then, later in the meeting... Yeah, as long as she doesn't come back and say, look, you mentioned this Bracknell issue, what is he talking about? Oh, we've known about that for, you know, two months. Um... We know she knows about the allegation. At the centre of the scandal is what went on here at Fujitsu's UK headquarters, where a team were able to access and change Horizon accounts all over the UK. We now have evidence suggesting that Paula Venels knew six years before the post office publicly admitted it during a high court case in 2019. In the recording, it suggested to the forensic accountants looking into any miscarriage of justice was not within their remit. Paul agrees that the original scope of the investigation did not go as far as looking at um, whether it was the um, miscarriage of justice point, Ron and Ian. So that's, that's not what she's looking for. She's, just, she's looking for the systematic, or systemic rather, not systematic, systemic weakness in the horizon system. Rubina was wrongly jailed for 12 months in 2010 for false accounting after a £40,000 shortfall in her branch. The secret recordings have brought it all back. It brings up a lot of emotions. Why did they do this to me when they knew everything? I'm really, really angry about this. Too stressed about it. Post Office says it's fully focused on supporting the public inquiry to get to the truth. Fujitsu, that it regards this matter with the utmost seriousness and is providing full cooperation to the inquiry. Meanwhile, the tapes have brought renewed pressure on Paula Venels, who MPs say they're looking to sanction. Adele Robinson, Sky News. Well, we've had a statement from Paula Venels via her lawyers. She says, I continue to support and focus on cooperating with the inquiry and expect to be giving evidence in the coming months. I'm truly sorry for the devastation caused to the sub-postmasters and their families whose lives were torn apart by being wrongly accused and wrongly prosecuted as a result of the Horizon system. I now intend to continue to focus on assisting the inquiry and will not be making any further public comment until it's concluded. The main suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann has appeared in court in Germany. He's accused of committing three rapes and two sexual assaults in Portugal between 2000 and 2017. Our crime correspondent Martin Brunt reports. Christian B arrived from his prison cell ready to meet one of his main accusers. Inside the courtroom, he looked like a man who knew what was coming. The handcuffs were off, but he could hardly relax. I watched a third video and there was another girl on it. Helga Bushing is the former friend who catapulted Christian B to notoriety. The witness told police that Christian B had confessed he was the abductor of missing Madeleine McCann. In 2017, he became the main suspect. He still is. The witness said he tipped off the McCann's investigator, Dave Edgar, 16 years ago. Mr Edgar said he didn't recall that and at the time had been sifting through thousands of leads. But here, Christian B is on trial for other things. He denies three rapes and two sex assaults, all allegedly committed in Portugal. The witness said he'd seen videotapes on which Christian B had filmed himself raping two of the victims. He stole the tapes, he said, from his old friend's rented home in Portugal. One showed a teenage girl tied to a wooden post and abused. On the other, he claimed, he saw an elderly woman raped on a bed. The defence lawyers questioned whether the videotapes ever existed. 
Investigators have never found them, and the witness said he sold them. There were tense exchanges throughout the day. The witness wouldn't give the court his home address. He refused to answer certain questions and was threatened with a fine. And when he said he couldn't remember things, the judge told the defence, perhaps it's the way you're asking him. The witness said when he gave Christian B's name to Scotland Yard, he didn't foresee the consequences. Mr Bushing said his involvement with the defendant had cost him his job, his home and his friends. Martin Brunt, Sky News in Braunschweig, Germany. We're still to come on the UK tonight as a Sky News investigation reveals there is no national plan to prepare Britain for war. We'll speak to a former British colonel about whether we are ready for any future conflict. And it's the glaring issue that's staring us in the face why campaigners are calling for car headlights to be less bright. It's one of the most dramatic sights in nature. A total solar eclipse, when day turns to night in a rare and spectacular sight. Join millions of people across Mexico, the US and Canada and watch the total eclipse live in a special program on Sky News. I mean, a recent study proved that with some beagles, those that had um, training after about the age of six were much more on the ball than those that didn't. I suppose you could say it's a no-brainer. Hey. So, you know, just with us, as with us, Kay, keeping yourself mentally dexterous, doing a crossword puzzle every day. Mr Binks, you're going on a bit of an adventure there. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> Thinks. So keeping your dog um, alert, boy. doing little tricks like maybe going into a down now, maybe turning away, not facing the camera, but we don't mind. Um, looking out for feeding your dogs a very healthy diet. So cutting out all the complex carbs, a bit like we're recommended to not eat overly processed foods every single day. Like we're recommended to get out and about, take in the fresh air, take up a new hobby, socialise a lot. And the interesting thing is, by owning a dog, <laughs> thinks by owning a dog, yeah. um, you actually tick so many of those boxes without having to try, Kate, because you're out walking your dog, you're out meeting other dog owners, so you're socialising, you feel like you're in a club. Um, so it's interesting to note that dog owners do tend to not get dementia as much as those people that don't own a dog. And it's all about going to the different places to see the different faces. And, um, and that keeps dogs alert um, and minimises um, dementia. But for me as well, it's the gut-brain axis that we're being told about very much on a human level. And you know, Kay, that you are what you eat. Yes. So keeping the dog's food healthy, keeping the dog eating foods that dogs are meant to eat, so lots of fresh meat, and antioxidants will also keep him really alert. But you see, he's looking around, he's yeah. well perky. Welcome back. Now, for the first time, an official investigation is to take place into whether headlights are too bright. The RAC says the issue has struck a chord with motorists after a petition calling for the government to examine whether car lights are too dazzling was signed by more than 10,000 people. Well, with us this evening is Baroness Diane Hayter, who sits in the House of Lords and has been calling for the government to take action over modern car headlights. Thanks very much for, for joining us and risking the roads to, <laughs> to get here. You, you're not alone, it seems. 10,000 people. What is, the, what is the issue here? It is interesting, because I've, I went to the optician thinking it was my eyes. And the optician said, oh, it's interesting you're coming in, so are lots of others, our patients. And actually, the problem isn't your eyes, it's the lights. So I got really interested in that stage and had a question in the House of Lords that got covered on the radio. And then a lot and a lot of people 
said it's the same. And it's basically two things. One is that the lights are now a much whiter or almost like a blue colour, much less of that sort of yellow of the old halogen lights. Um, and they, our eyes are not very good at adapting to them. The wavelength is much shorter, so it really hits the back of your pupil. And the other problem is quite a lot of these new headlights now are supposedly automatic, but so that they come down from full beam, but actually they don't come down fast enough. So they're still full on when they see a car coming towards them. So it's great for the driver in the car with the bright headlights, mm. but if you're the oncoming car, or indeed a pedestrian or on a motorbike, mm. it's pretty blinding. And we've, we've all experienced it, but what, what do you experience when, when you get that really dazzling glare from another car? Well, I try and look away. I mean, it's a bit, but but if you, even if you look away, you you know it would already have hit your eyes for a moment. So you may be blinded for a couple of seconds, and you know at speed you're done quite a few yards at that point. Um, so I try and look away. But the uh, the other problem is that basically I was stopping driving at night, mm. and a lot of people have said they're doing that, and that's disastrous for your family life, for your social life. Um, and particularly, of course, we're just coming out of winter, but when the days are short, it's a lot of time when people can't be using their cars. So we've got to do something about it. We can't just say, oh, it's a problem, it's new lights. We've got to solve this, and that's what we're asking the government to do. Well, and we have this, this review, and um, what, what do you hope that will achieve? Well, I th the first bit's already achieved is that the government's recognised there's a problem. What I hope it will achieve is recognising what it is. Is it the brightness? Is it the intensity? Is it the colour in the light? Is it the angle of which they are? Is it that we shouldn't have the automatic thing, we should leave it to, to human beings again? And I think only an expert group can look at that. And I'm not as worried about what is the solution. Um, I think that by the government doing the research, and incidentally, we're talking to our opposite numbers in other European countries who find exactly the same. So if our government can talk to motor manufacturers and to governments across other countries, then we could all get together and have new regulations that think about the oncoming driver mm. um, and, and make sure that they're dipped and less bright so that we're safer on the roads. It's a serious business, isn't it? Because I see the estimates 280 collisions a year uh, since 2013. With, with dazzling being being cited as a factor and, and a number of those fatal this is a this is a real world as much as people may think it's it's their own eyesight or their own problem or, or a minor complaint it's a significant issue it's a significant issue for safety uh, absolutely and I'm sure actually it's more than that because I think if you had an accident you may not blame yourself and say oh I was blinded because you might think that you're that was your fault if you like um, but the other one is as I say the social issue uh, of people actually having more restricted lives and of the people who contacted me it's more of the women actually who are choosing not to drive at night uh, and that is quite a curtailment um, of, of social life. Less for someone like me who lives in London, but if you live in the country and you have no other way of getting around and you, feel, you don't feel safe anymore driving, that is a really big problem. So I think it's quite urgent. Mm -hmm. There's more and more cars now being designed with these very bright lights and they're almost being advertised on the basis of that. And I think we've got to stop that before we um, drive even more people off the road. You mentioned the cars and, and people talk about SUVs, which are higher, obviously, so the lights are higher, the, the speed bump issue. Is there an element of human behaviour, though? Are we a bit more selfish these days and are not so aware that we might be responsible for not, not dipping headlights quickly enough? Well, I think the problem is that they're not dipped. Uh, I mean, they are dipped, but it looks as if they're not. Mm. Uh, there are, I know when I, my own car's lights now are dipped, I think they're still too bright and they're still too high. And it used to be that when you dipped your car, you really could notice that, the, you know, the, the lights was going off to the left. And, in fact, when you travel abroad, you have... You put a regular, you know, something on to make it mm. go to the right. Um, I don't notice anymore that switch away from the oncoming car towards the left. That should be something quite easy for car manufacturers to do. I am aware you've got to get every car manufacturer and every light manufacturer to do this, but I think there are some simple things you can do to change the angle, even if the brightness will take a little longer to solve. OK, well, we'll see what comes from this government action. Baroness Diane Hater, thank you very much for joining us. Stay safe uh, on your way home tonight.
We're well, still to come tonight on the UK Tonight. Has the UK gone soft on defence? We'll speak to a former army colonel who led troops in Iraq about the Sky News investigation, revealing there's no national plan for the defence of the UK. And we'll speak to a man stepping down from walking up Helvellyn in the Lake District every single day. Welcome back to the UK tonight. Now, with multiple conflicts continuing, ministers have described the times we live in as a pre-war world. And against this backdrop, you'd think the government would have a plan for the defence of the UK. Well, Sky News can reveal that it does not. But officials are now starting to develop a cross-government national defence plan. Here's Sky's security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, with her exclusive report. When the Cold War ended, Mike Parrish picked up a hot bargain. A top-secret nuclear bunker built by the government under his family's farmland. So would we be safe once we got to this part? Well, yes, safer than being outside, obviously, because you've got the blast door to go through to start with. Now a tourist attraction, it's taken on a new relevance amid warnings of future war. The United Kingdom was heavily attacked with nuclear weapons at one o'clock this afternoon. This is where the Prime Minister of the day might have come in the event of a nuclear strike. The underground safe house in Essex was one of a network of bunkers tasked with keeping government services running to help survivors. The scale of this bunker underlines how seriously governments during the Cold War took the threat of nuclear attack and global conflict. Thankfully, these defences were never actually needed, 
but at least they had a plan that was resourced and regularly rehearsed. In the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Britain's defence secretary has warned we're moving to a pre-war world. Yet sources have told Sky News there is no national plan for the defence of the UK or the mobilisation of its people in a full-scale conflict. It's a weakness this former commander raised internally more than a decade ago. The implications of thinking about the revitalisation of a risk from Russia were unpalatable and expensive, and denial, frankly, was cheaper. Tucked away in the National Archives are some of the UK's old defence plans. Called the Government War Book, they detailed how this country would transition from peace to war in line with a set of alerts for the whole of NATO. Versions have existed since around the end of the First World War, with instructions for everything from calling out the reserves to rescuing national treasures. But this level of planning is expensive and it was quietly phased out after the Soviet Union collapsed. Of course, the UK has a range of strategies and frameworks to build resilience and counter threats. But sources tell me it's woefully inadequate compared to the Cold War way of thinking. And they say much more must be done. While the UK relies on its nuclear weapons and NATO membership to deter threats, Officials are understood to be developing a cross-government national defence plan, even drawing on lessons from the war book. Some of that kind of thinking, the thinking that takes you from we don't need to worry about any of that to actually if we did want to worry about that, how might we do it, I think that's really important. And it's not just thinking about the military, industry and the public have crucial roles as well. Now a car plant this site in Birmingham was transformed from farmland into a Spitfire factory before the Second World War as part of a so-called shadow scheme to grow aircraft production. Facilities also sprang up in the most unlikely of places, including a cow shed in Shropshire. Shadow factories like this one played a key role in the war, enabling the country to make the weapons it needed to win, it's a legacy of innovation that sources say leaders today should draw on as they look to deter the current threats. Asked about the allegation that there's no plan for war, a Cabinet Office spokesperson said, The UK has robust plans in place for a range of potential emergencies and scenarios, with plans and supporting arrangements developed, refined and tested over many years. Practical steps taken to enhance the nation's resilience include the introduction of the emergency alert system and other measures, including the UK Government Resilience Framework, the publication of the National Risk Register and strengthening our work with local partners and frontline authorities. But critics aren't convinced, such as here in Southampton, the home of the Spitfire. Well, we had a bomb in the garden. We were in the shelter, but my father was outside. Vera Saxby lived through the Second World War. She volunteered to work for a company that made Spitfire parts. Now, in her hundredth year, she's no longer impressed with the UK's resilience. It's very difficult. I can't see how we would defend ourselves. But don't tell Putin that. <laughs> The end of the tunnel, which is... Britain's hollowed-out defences are no secret to anyone as global threats grow. Do you think this bunker might have to come back to life again? It would obviously be something one would contemplate. I don't suppose that the government would now take this back. But until government do that, of course, it's mine. And so I've got the keys and um, I'll be down here national preparations for war, perhaps no longer a practice of the past. Deborah Haynes, Sky News. Well, we can speak now to the former British Army Colonel Tim Collins, who was the commanding officer of the 1st Battalion, the Royal Irish Regiment, 
during the Iraq war. Tim Collins, um, thanks for joining us uh, on Sky News this evening. Um, it seems a pretty alarming report. Do you think Britain's ready? We have a, um, a nuclear deterrent, which is apparently at sea. Uh, we spent a lot of money on it and um, we test it. And the one thing we can assure our adversaries if it came to nuclear war is that um, we can hit anywhere in the world um, with multiple warheads and our warheads work. Uh, our adversaries have the problem that they've neglected their warheads over the years because of cost. And um, some, like North Korea, are still developing them, and, and who knows, Iran. But what they can be absolutely certain of is that uh, were they to attack us, and we, we don't have a first strike policy, but we have a retaliation policy, our retaliation is um, total and complete, and, and they can be absolutely assured of that. That's a nuclear deterrent. Uh, it, to go from, from zero to that point would... would be a, a major move, wouldn't it? What if we were talking about a, an attack by a swarm of drones, for example? Would that be the deterrent? Or, or does Britain have alternatives to a nuclear deterrent beyond, beyond going to that, that extreme point? Well, we've spent quite a, a deal of money on um, various systems. That the um, we, We've bought into the F-35 programme um, and uh, we, we have a significant number of uh, uh, those coming online along with our Typhoon aircraft. So from the air, we don't have enough of them um, we probably need to buy more, but we've got a significant um, capability. Uh, in terms of the, the, the naval capability, I think our submarine fleet is um, our best defence. Um, the, the aircraft carriers have been um, outmoded by things like drones. The Army is the, 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 um, the failure to recruit and the inability to recruit is a national scandal. Um, and until the, the, the Ministry of Defence wake up to this, and I think the, the civil servants in the, the Ministry of Defence are, are a significant part of the problem. In the Army, we used to call the, uh, the, the, the civil servants the SA-80s. You can't fire them, they don't work. And uh, that's part of our problem. And, and if they were working for the Russians, they're doing a good job. The problem is that uh, th there's the, the, the line in the sand. We're not able to recruit people into our military fast enough. Um, but I think broadly, we have to remember we're part of an alliance uh, and in order to get to the United Kingdom, they have to come through a number of significant um, hurdles uh, past the Poles, past the Germans, uh, past the Dutch and past the, the Belgians and even the French before they get to us. And that's why countries like the Republic of Ireland spend nothing or virtually nothing on defence. They entirely rely on the United Kingdom to provide their um, cover for air and for naval um, and that's fair enough, um, but uh, the uh, the government itself and the Republic aren't doing very little, but huge numbers of Irishmen are serving in the British Army uh, and in the Navy and the Air Force. And I, I think that, um, broadly speaking, um, the the, um, the certainty that the, the enemy and potentially um, we look at enemies and it could be Russia, it could be others, um, have is that um, we have the capability to defend ourselves, but we're probably not as well disposed as we, we could have been. Beyond military, the, the, the question is whether the public is resilient enough, whether industry could be stood up quickly enough as it, as it was at the time of the Second World War. Do you think that resilience is there, that public resilience, that industrial resilience, beyond whatever the military can or can't do? Well, I think you've put your finger on it there, Greg, in terms of the, the industrial rule. Um, our capacity to produce steel is negligible at the moment. Um, our industrial capacity has been run down, so our capacity to independently make uh, equipment uh, is in a, a perilous state and would be heavily reliant on allies to do that. So I, I think at some point um, there's a, um, a policy mission for government to look at uh, make sh making sure that we we maintain and retain the um, the capability to make the steel, to have the factories to make the weapons we need, to have the um, ca capacity to protect the technologies which we're developing, and, and that that's a significant weakness. Do you think the the Russian invasion of of Ukraine has changed the picture in in how the UK needs to be prepared? Well, I think we have to remember history. And in 1905, the Russians were heavily defeated in uh, the, the, at Port Arthur by the, the Japanese. And they um, many changes happened in Russia, but they started to rearm. And the German general staff looked at Russia and realized that by 1916, a rearmed uh, Russia 
could and would crush Germany, and that's why they went to war in 1914. So we have to remember uh, Russians, Russia's capability to regenerate. Um, it's said that after the attacks um, recently on the um, the theatre in Moscow, that over 100,000 men have volunteered and joined the Russian army. Gives you an idea of the capacity they have to generate uh, capability, and we have to be aware of that. We have to be prepared to counter that. I think our allies in the Baltic states or the, the front line, our allies in um, Finland and, and Sweden are taking this very seriously. I know that our allies in, in Poland and Romania are taking this seriously. We need to be behind them. Colonel Tim Collins, thanks very much for joining us on the UK tonight. We're coming up on the UK tonight. After 778 climbs, we'll speak to the man finally hanging up his boots as a Lake District mountain safety assessor. And in sport, we'll hear why Formula One legend Sebastian Vettel is demanding more transparency in the sport after the allegations made against Red Bull boss Christian Horner. Dowd and I'm Sky's Midlands correspondent. We can reveal that the driver who hit Harry Dunn is 42-year-old Anne Sekoulas. Just met the president and we never thought we'd get this far. This is what they're up against, is back-breaking work. Water levels are dropping, but no one knows what impact further rain will have. What would you do if this place wasn't open? We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's really scary. In this community, I'm told that everybody knows someone affected by COVID. Change seems tantalisingly close in this corner of the UK. This is my patch, my specialism. It's also my home. Welcome back to the UK tonight. Teddy is here with all the sport now and um, some strong words from a Formula One legend about transparency in the sport. Yeah, really interesting interview, actually, on the Sky News Breakfast Show with Kay Burley earlier on. Sebastian Vettel, four-time world champion, uh, won with Red Bull through 2010 through 2013. And talking about, in part, his former team, uh, his team, former team principal, Christian Horner, who was alleged by a female colleague of inappropriate behaviour. That's been cleared after a review by the Red Bull uh, team, of course, uh, the Team G. MBH, the overall team, but Sebastian Vettel just suggesting that perhaps it would be good if this was more open to the public so people could assess it for themselves. So here's a clip of what he had to say. When you don't know everything, then it's hard to make or draw a conclusion. I understand that, you know, uh, you want to respect private matters as well um, with the involved individuals. So it's a slippery slope, but I think in the big picture, you know, you have a certain responsibility. Um, to, uh, you know, explain to your audience what's exactly or what, what, what's going on to then be able to draw the right conclusions. So um, that's where I just feel if things were a bit more clear for everyone, then it would be easier to make a, make a judgment. 
and also a bit of a hint to, to a return to F1. Well, I suppose days of your 36 would be almost too old, wouldn't it? We've got for Lewis Hamilton, who's, who's still out there. We've got Fernando Alonso at 42, and, and Sebastian Vettel's made it a little bit of a hint. Yeah, it crossed my mind, he says, and nothing concrete at the moment. But amazingly, he was only 26 years of age when he won that fourth world title in 2013. Then we thought he may become the record uh, title champion winner in terms of surpassing Michael Schumacher. Not worked out that way for him. But hints with the big uh, flux in Formula One next season with uh, Lewis Hamilton going to Ferrari, that perhaps he could be linked to Mercedes and tempted back. He says nothing concrete, as we say, but one to perhaps watch in, in Formula One once that shake-up happens with Hamilton going to Italy next year. And uh, meanwhile, away from uh, Formula One, it is a busy night in the Premier League. Let's update you on a couple of games that are key to the title race. Just a second. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. I never really thought it was anything other than not the norm until I got to like 24, 25. I was spending so much of my day just worrying about a certain way I was doing everything I was doing. It would take up so much of your day, add extra stress and extra worry to your life. When were you first diagnosed with OCD? What, what kind of led to the diagnosis? Throughout my whole childhood I would, I would have to do certain things to, to feel, feel okay or to feel safe or for my my friends and family and loved ones to, for me to have like um, peace of mind that nothing bad was going to happen or anything like that. There'd always be so many different things that I'd have to do to like, sort of like a checklist. Never really spoke about it with anyone else, but I just thought I just thought that was something you do. It wasn't until I mentioned it to a couple of people when I when I was playing at Exeter Chiefs and they said, "Yeah, that's a bit, that's a bit weird. Like you shouldn't be doing that." What kind of things were you doing or thinking? So there's a light switch on the wall there. I'd have to click it the right way. I don't know how you describe the right way, but to me there was a right and a wrong way to click a light switch on and off. If I didn't do it right, I had to do it a certain amount of times. If, and if I didn't do it right on the final one, I had to do it. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Thanks, Teddy. And finally tonight, after 778 ascents, my next guest is retiring from what might be the loveliest and the highest job in Britain. For 16 years, John Bennett has been part of the safety team which climbs Helvellyn in the Lake District every day to make sure the mountain is safe for walkers and visitors. And I'm glad to say retiring fell top assessor John joins us now. John, good evening. Thanks very much for, for joining us on uh, the UK tonight. It's a job I'm sure that everybody tells you they'd love to have. Why are you giving it up? <laughs> Everyone always says, Greg, they love it on the days when they meet, when the sun's shining and it's bright, clear skies and it's absolutely glorious. There's some strange reason people don't say that when it's uh, pouring of rain, vertical, uh, sorry, horizontal hail and uh, the mist is down and everything else. So, uh, yes, <laughs> it's one of those. You need to be a goldfish actually to do the job that I do or did. Uh, to, to forget you about the, the good to days about the forget worst. about the bad ones. Yeah. Why, why are you giving it up? Uh, I'm just finding that the hill's getting that little bit steeper as I get older. And plus the fact uh, I'm also getting a lot softer in my old age. So, like I just said, uh, I'm looking forward now to going out on days when it's it's lovely, like these pictures show, and possibly not going out on some of the uh, less clement days, should we say. It's it time to get somebody younger to do the job. It is a, a beautiful scene, isn't it? What um, What's the, the, the job of... I'd never heard of a fell top assessor. What is the... What is the role that you have in, in going up there every day? Right. What we do is we operate from the 1st of December to Bank Holiday Monday for Easter, so over the winter months. And what we're doing is we're assessing the ground conditions during the winter months. Because obviously the vast majority of people come up to the Lake District during the summer and they go out on the fells and it's all lovely and green. And, for example, you can get a lovely grassy slope on a slight angle in the summer, you wouldn't think anything of going on it. In the winter, if you get a bit of snow on it, it slightly thaws, then freezes solid. It can just be like um, a, a vertical ice skating rink. And so unless you're equipped to deal with that, you know, with crampons, with ice axes and the skill to traverse that terrain safely, you can come into serious trouble. So what we're doing is we're going up and assessing what the conditions are like. 
so that people can actually know what they can um, expect when they go up there. So we go up and we assess what uh, height the snow begins at. I mean, that sounds a bit basic, but quite often in the valleys, you can't actually see the snow at all. So we say, what uh, level the snow begins at? What the snow's like? Is it soft? Is it hard? Um, do you need crampons, especially equipment crampons and ice axes to, to traverse it safely? Uh, is it so snof, soft and liable to slip? People don't realise you can get some small slow slides in the Lake District, which could carry people or whatever away. And um, then we get to the top, we take um, some measurements, particularly uh, temperature, wind chill, so people know what uh, the temperature will feel like when you get up there. Um, and then just let people know what they need to be safe on the fells so they can have the information to go out on the fells and be safe. Yeah, we hear so much about people not being prepared, climbing all kinds of things. We heard yesterday of cavers who've gone down in flip-flops. Do, do you find people are generally pretty well prepared or are theirs who, who take a bit of a chance? Uh, you get both, basically. Uh, yes, particularly we find when you can't actually see the snowy conditions in the valleys because quite often you can arrive at a car park and all you can see are green hills and you can't actually see the snow level above that because either the terrain is uh, a, um, obscuring the view or it's cloudy or whatever. Um, so we do people find people start going up and then uh, get to a certain height and then find it's icy or what have you and then you get that thing of, oh, I've got to get to the top now because I've come so far and that's when problems can start. So that's why it's very important to get the information out there before people leave the cars and leave the valleys know what they can expect. And just briefly, you're looking forward to some more leisurely walks on those good days. Very, very much so, yes. I'm, I'm hanging up my boots for work, but I'm certainly, certainly not hanging them up for leisure. No, I'll be out there. Uh, I hope to, I met a guy once on the top of a Scarfell Pike on his 80th birthday, and he's celebrating by being up England's highest mountain on his 80th. So I obviously shook his hand and said, that's inspirational, that's what I want to do. So if I'm still here, that's my aim. Well, that's pretty impressive. John Bennett, uh, we really appreciate you, um, you taking the time to join us and we wish you a, a very happy climbing retirement. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Steve. Very nice to talk to you. Well, time for a look at the weather here now. It'll stay unsettled through the weekend when unseasonably strong winds are expected with bands of rain spreading from the southwest. Before then, central parts will may be mainly fine this evening, but the north will be rather murky with outbreaks of rain and hill snow. That's all from the UK tonight. You can catch up on all the highlights on our webpage. Just scan the QR code on the screen and you can share your thoughts with us there too. We'll be back here tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. We'll see you then. Coming up at 9 o'clock, family tributes to those killed in the aid convoy in Gaza and a question of whether the UK might ban arms sales to Israel. What difference would that make, even if it was simply a symbolic gesture? That's all coming up.